Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you as we worship together this morning. As many of you know, I've taken a little bit of leave, and so the sermon for today is actually going to be a, ser a sermon that I preached last year, but it forms a very helpful prequel to the Easter Sunday message I preached last week, and I do think that it will be a, a blessing to you. I hope so anyway. But a very warm welcome to you as we worship together. And as the service progresses, the, the context of the scripture reading is the Sea of Galilee. And a number of the pictures behind the songs and behind the prayers are pictures from uh, around the Sea of Galilee. And I hope that that will put you into a frame of mind of the service. I do pray that you'll enjoy the service and God bless you and be with you. Our call to worship is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 to 21. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Let us worship God together as we sing, Don't You Know, It's Time to Praise the Lord. Our Father in heaven, how great is your love for us. For there is nowhere that we can go that your love does not cover us. For there is nowhere that we can go that your love does not enfold us. And we give you thanks and we give you praise for you and you alone are God. You are the God for whom there is no end. You are the God for whom there is no beginning. Because you are the beginning and the end. You are everything. You are all. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth of the universe. You are the author and the perfecter. You are the one who loves us. You are the one who cares for us. You are the one, our God, who has died for us. You are the one, our God, who has redeemed us. You, O oh God, are the one who has rescued and sustains us. And so we praise you, our God, for there is none like you. You are the only true God, the everlasting God, the God of love. But Lord, we know that our salvation, we know that the price that was paid for our everlasting life was a high one. It was the price of your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, we come humbly 
We come in awe. We come trembling. But we come confidently approaching the throne of grace, confessing our sins before you. Hear our prayers, O Lord, as we confess to you. Thank you, Lord, that you are good. Thank you, Lord, that you are true. Thank you, Lord, that you set us free. Thank you, Lord, that we are forgiven. Thank you, Lord, that we are reconciled. Thank you that our sins are remembered no more. What an amazing God you are. And so we praise you, our Father. We praise you, the Lord Jesus. We praise you, Holy Spirit, giving thanks for your goodness, your love, your mercy, and for your gift of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. and girls. Hope you had a lovely week so far and a lovely day yesterday. What I want to share with you today is that you all can remember last Sunday was Easter Sunday and I'm sure you all had lots of fun. You had Easter egg hunt and you had lots of Easter eggs and I'm sure you had a great day and you also remember the message, the great message of Easter Sunday. But you know what, when I got home from church on Sunday, I was dying to have an Easter egg. So I went to the cupboard, and I took out the box of Easter eggs, and I couldn't wait for a yummy, yummy Easter egg, and I opened the box, and oh no, it was empty. No more Easter eggs for me. That was not good. Has it happened to you? I'm sure a lot of Easter eggs have gone by now. And you know what else happened to me? I wanted to make coffee and I was dying for a rusk. And I took, I went to the tin, opened the tin. (gasps) Also empty. Who had the last one? I wonder. Oh no, have you ever made yourself a cup of coffee? Poured in the coffee and the milk. And you must add the sugar. Can't wait for coffee. Oh no. That's also empty. No sugar. That's not going to make a nice cup of coffee, is it? And you know, has it ever happened to you that you've gone to the bathroom and oh no, this is empty. What a predicament is that then? Do you know that made me think? If you take a stone and you put a stone in front, it reminded me of the tomb that Jesus was in. And that Easter Sunday, 
That Sunday when Mary went to the tomb, the stone was rolled away and the grave was empty. And instead of being bad news, it was good news, wasn't it? Because that means Jesus is alive. Like Luke tells us in Luke 24, um, verse 5, the angel said to Mary, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he has risen. Remember, he told you. So isn't that lovely that we can remember that he's alive? You must tell me quickly, how do you know you're alive? Put your heart here on your chest. Can you feel your heart beating? That means you're alive. And Jesus is alive. And Jesus is alive because he is living inside our hearts. And that's why we can so be so happy and we can live for him. So isn't that great news? Doesn't matter how many empty containers we have, we know that emptiness is actually full of life and goodness. Let's pray. Close your eyes. Thank you, Father God, that you sent your Son to save us. Thank you, that Jesus, that you are alive and that you are in our hearts and that we can live every day in gratitude because you love us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us every day of our lives. Thank you for everything and thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our scripture reading takes us to the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It's just after the first week of Jesus' resurrection. Remember, he rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, appeared to the disciples, and then a week later, he appeared to them in the same room, but this time with Thomas present. From there, it seems that the disciples returned to Galilee. And this was probably where Jesus spent the remainder of his 40 days on earth, with the disciples in that quieter setting where he could nurture them and mentor them. But we're told that as the disciples went back to Galilee, Peter decides that he wants to go fishing. Let's listen to, to, to this passage again. You've seen some pictures of the Sea of Galilee. Put your mind into the scene. It's dawn. They've been fishing through the night. It's maybe a little bit misty. There's a, 
a figure on the shore. They can't quite make him out. In particular, I'd love you to keep your eye on Peter. Uh, bearing in mind this is the future leader of the church and, and watch his actions. The reading is from John 21, verses 1 to 14. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there, with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts bring you praise and glory, O Lord, now and forevermore. Amen. I think for the disciples, there was something similar going on. I think they knew in their heart of hearts that things had irrevocably changed that there was no going back to what it was. Jesus had appeared to them twice, and he told them to meet him in Galilee. And so they went to Galilee. But I wonder what was going on in their heads and hearts. I wonder how they were coming to terms with what the future might look like. I think there are four questions we need to ask of the passage that we read today. The first of those questions is, why did they go fishing? The second is, what was the same, but yet different? The third is, why were they so unsettled? If, if you remember how they were trying to interact with Jesus, there's a certain degree of discomfort in their interaction with him. And the fourth question is, so what does all of this mean? What does all of this mean? Let's start with the first question then. Why do they go fishing? Why, as they're sitting in Galilee waiting for Jesus, why do they go fishing? And there are three possible answers to this question. And the simplest one is that they were bored and had nothing better to do. And that for Peter, maybe fishing relaxed him. It was what he'd done most of his life. And that was his happy place, his space to be outside and fresh air. And, and it was something to do. The second reason, and that's a, 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 a sadder one, is that they were going back to, to what they'd known because in their minds it was all over. Jesus had risen from the dead and he told them that he was going to ascend into heaven. So they weren't going to be traveling around the countryside ministering with Jesus and they thought that it was all over. And so they were just going back to what they'd done before. The third reason is for me, possibly the most compelling or the most exciting reason, and that is that they went back to the fishing boat because that's kind of where it all began. And if you think about that fishing boat and all that it must have meant to them, and they'd 
traveled uh, across the Sea of Galilee numerous times in that boat. Uh, Jesus had fallen asleep and then calmed a storm that Jesus had walked out onto the water and met them in that boat. That boat was a place where, where they'd spent time with Jesus. And, and in some ways, that was an old friend for them. And maybe they went back to that boat because they wanted some kind of connection with the time that they'd spent with Jesus. And that in some ways they were trying to recreate a moment. And that leads us very naturally into the second question. And the second question is, so what was the same, but what was different? Let's start with the things that were the same. I call them the deja vu moments. And, and here we're comparing to, to three other places in the New Testament. The first is Luke's account of, of the, the big catch of fish. And, and that's the big catch of fish that happens at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And the other passage that, that there are some similarities to is the feeding of the 5,000. And the third passage is from John 18, which is in the high court of, of uh, at least in the courtyard of the high priest. So let's look at the similarities. The similarities are that they fished all night, but got nothing. That Jesus invited them to throw their net out again. In Luke, Jesus tells them, and, and he's been using their boat as, as a pulpit to preach to the crowds. And, and when he's finished, he says, go out into deeper water, throw your nets out. And they throw their nets out and they catch loads and loads of fish. In John's account, they also have fished all night. And this time Jesus says, throw your net out on the other side. But when they do it, they catch a huge amount of fish. The other similarity is that both times when they catch huge numbers of fish, Peter responds. In Luke, Peter falls down in front of Jesus and says, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Now in John's Gospel, when Peter realizes that it's Jesus, he puts on his outer garment and then jumps into the water and wades to the shore. And to our modern minds, that doesn't really make sense. I mean, the outer garment is nice and dry on the boat. And then Peter puts it on and gets it sopping wet as he wades to the shore. But this is Jewish custom, that it would have been considered disrespectful for Peter to go and greet Jesus dressed only in his undergarments. And so as a sign of huge respect for Jesus, Peter puts on his outer garment, even though it's going to get sopping wet. And that's how he goes to meet the Lord. The remaining similarities are the charcoal fire that Jesus has burning on the shore uh, when the disciples get there and he's already got some bread and fish on. And uh, those uh, have parallels or, or they connect to uh, New Testament stories. The one is Peter in the courtyard of the high priest. And the other, of course, is Jesus feeding the 5,000. And we'll touch on, on the details of those a little bit later. So those are the similarities. Let's look at the differences. The first significant difference is that the first time Jesus helps them to catch a whole lot of fish, he's a country preacher. He's a Nazarene. He's a carpenter. He's speaking to the crowds. But the second time around, he's the son of God who has died on the cross and risen from the dead. And as the disciples encounter him the second time, he is now not an unknown quantity, but a known quantity. And as they experience him doing the same thing. In their own eyes, they are seeing him differently and they are seeing him with new eyes. The second important point that we need to make is that although in, Jesus has helped them catch a whole number of fish again, there are some differences. In Luke's account, the net fills with so many fish that the net begins to break. And we're not told how many fish they have. This time round, we're told that the net didn't break. And we're told that there are 153 fish inside the net. Now the scholars go backwards and forwards about what these 153 fish are all about. And why would John even bother telling us that there were 153 fish? But the best explanation that there is comes from the church father Jerome, who noted that in the Greco-Roman time, there were... 153 recorded species of fish and that in effect 
what we're being told is that these fish represent all the fish that they could ever catch. But maybe there is a deeper meaning in all of this. And we have to remember that this is John writing and the early church didn't use a cross as its symbol as we do today. Instead, they used a fish as their symbol and the church in Rome would draw the little symbol of a fish which looked like a Greek alpha on the entrances to the catacombs where they would have their their secret gatherings. And this symbol was used to identify the Christian community wherever they went. The Greek word ichthus, the letters of that word, stood for Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. And so the earliest symbol of the church was the fish. John writing his gospel at the end of his life, being aware of this fact and noting that there had been 153 fish would have, I think, had a a wry smile on his face as he wrote these words down for us, reminding us that maybe it wasn't just 153 fish and a net that didn't break, but a symbol of the church. That no matter what the church goes through, it won't break. And that the church's job is to bring all of humanity into its fold. That nobody is to be excluded from the church. And that the church is open to absolutely everyone. The next startling difference lies in the charcoal fire that Jesus has burning on the beach. As I mentioned earlier, the other place that we find the charcoal fire is in John 18, 18. The Greek word is anthrakion. Think about the the English word anthracite, and then you're on the right track. This was a a, a coal fire made with with not wood, but, but coal, maybe an acrid smelling coal. And the last time Peter had smelt that smell was in the courtyard of the high priest on the night that Jesus was arrested, the night that Peter had betrayed Jesus three times or denied Jesus three times. Now, he smells that smell again. But this time round, Jesus goes for a walk with Simon Peter. And Simon Peter gets an opportunity to declare his love for the Lord three times. Once for each time that he had denied him. The final difference that we have between the two passages is that, or or between uh, our accounts, is that John records that Jesus brought some fish and some bread. He simply added some more fish from the what the disciples caught to his bry flesh or his bry fish. But when he fed the 5,000, it's a little boy who brings loaves and fish to him. And maybe what we're being told here is that Jesus will provide for his church, that he will feed us and nourish us and nurture us. The third quick question that we have to deal with is that the disciples seem very unsettled when they encounter Jesus. John says, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew that it was the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have expected a, a greater degree of familiarity and comfort. But, but John's phrasing is, indicates a, a level of discomfort, a, a dis-ease that, that, that they have. But maybe that's exactly right. This isn't just the carpenter, the Nazarene preacher. This isn't the teacher or the rabbi. This is the risen son of God. And as they encounter him on the beach, there is a level of respect that they show. And, and, and they're there humbly to see what it is that he has for them and to learn from him. So let's pull all of that together. We've had a very different Easter. And we are going back into a very different world. As we cope with these changes, with these shifts, as we anticipate going into a new world, we're very much in the same place that the disciples were. And I think there is a lot for us to connect to as they climb into the boat, trying to figure out what it's going to look like. You and I will go back to the familiarity of church and and society, but things are going to be different. And there are five things that we can hold on to. The first is 
that Jesus will find us as we adjust. As the disciples are grappling and, and, and out on the boat looking for, for meaning, Jesus finds them. And he will find us as we wrestle and grapple with our changed reality. The second thing is that Jesus will fill our nets. He will fill our nets. He will do what we can't. When in our own efforts we toil all night, He will do what we can't. He will fill our nets. The third thing is that He will forgive us and nourish us. When we come with our brokenness and our regrets, our failures, when we have nothing to show, when our tanks are empty, he will forgive us and he will nourish us. But there's work for us to do. And those 153 fish, I think, were a symbol of the church. But in some ways, I think it also was a signal. You're done fishing. You've caught all the fish you're ever going to catch. Now, get on with my work. There is work to be done. And whether we see it as being done with the past and moving into the future, or whether we see it as needing to bring all of humanity to God, to bring every human being whose life we can touch to God, we have work to do. Finally, I think it's imperative that we recognize it. When John saw that it was Jesus, Peter put on his outer garment, went to the shore with deep respect. Yes, with love, but with deep respect. The disciples weren't too quick to be familiar with Jesus. There is a recognition that he is the Son of God, that he is risen from the dead, that he is Lord over the grave. And as you and I come to him in this time, we need to come recognizing that he is greater than we are. There are so many folk who have opinions and ideas, many who are very quick to pontificate about the what's and the why's and the wherefore's. And I think by the time all of this is done, we're going to have to recognize that we have to let God be God. And there are some things that we will never fully understand or fully grasp, except to know that he is with us. Let's pray. Lord, in this beautiful account, you meet with your disciples who are struggling to find their way. And you give them direction. You give them direction through the familiar, but also through that which has changed. But mostly through your presence And who you are, risen from the dead, Son of God. We recognize, Lord, that we can never contain you or tame you. That we will never fully understand you. That we cannot grasp you or hold you. That we have to let you be Lord in our lives. And so with Peter, Lord, we would throw on our, our outer garments and jump into the water. We want to be with you. But we also want to recognize that you are King and Lord of our lives. And so, Lord, be with us. We ask for your guidance. We ask that you would lead us. We ask that you would show us the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
while we don't have a physical offering bag we can pass around, we do have the opportunity, however, to offer something more important than just our treasures. We have the opportunity to offer our lives as an act of worship. So let's join together as we pray. Father of love, thank you that you are our strength and song. Thank you that you fill our hearts with joy and gladness. We know that everything is from you, and so we offer ourselves as an act of worship to you. May our offered lives grow into fruitful trees of life, growing your kingdom here on earth. May we be filled and in turn offer all your fullness and goodness to this world. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we come to the table, I've left on the table the symbols of that Old Testament ritual that I spoke to the children about. But Jesus gave us a new ritual, the ritual of the Last Supper, Communion, or Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving. And here we remember that His body was broken for us and His blood was shed for us. And although we'll use a simplified order of service this morning, the same richness and fullness applies. As we come to this table, we remember that Jesus gave his life for you and I. We remember that this was a long time coming. These promises were given all the way from the Old Testament, and now they are fulfilled in us. And so we give thanks to God that we can celebrate together, that in this meal we draw near to him and he strengthens us. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, on this Resurrection Sunday, we come into your presence thanking you that you conquered death, that you broke the power of sin, and that we are your children, forgiven, made new, and restored. And with Peter, we would walk on the beach with you, wanting, Lord, to feed your sheep, to take care of your lambs, and to feed your lambs. But Lord, it's only because of your love that we can do this, only because of your grace that we are able. And so we thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Lord Jesus, that you endured the cross, Holy Spirit, that you make this real to our hearts. And with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying together, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, not as we are, not as we ought, but only as we are able, do we give you thanks for your body broken for us and your blood shed for us. And we ask you, Spirit, sanctify us in these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread will be to us the body of Christ, that the cup will be to us the blood of Christ, and that as we eat and drink, we may partake of your body and blood to our spiritual benefit and our growth in grace. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so according to the example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in remembrance of him, we do this, who on the night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. After supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you are the Redeemer of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, as you take away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. I invite you to participate with me as I eat the bread and as I take the wine. Please join with me. The body of Christ 
was broken for me and for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. Jesus' blood was shed for you and for me. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Peace be with you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you are our Lord in heaven and in our hearts. How majestic is your name in all the earth. We thank you for all you are to us. You are our loving Father. We are grateful that your love is ever forgiving and constant. We thank you that your love for us is so great that it is beyond our understanding. We thank you that you love each and every person in the world and that all our lives matter to you and that you have a plan for each of our lives. We thank you that we can rely on your promises, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We know that you have the whole world in your hands, regardless of what is happening around us. We ask you to be with all people who have suffered pain, loss and grief during this period of COVID. May they come to know your healing power, your love and your peace. We pray for our country and her leaders. We ask you to be with our leaders and give them wisdom as they make decisions. May they learn to seek you for guidance. May you also guide our church leaders who have the responsibility of leading our churches. We ask you to draw near to all medical staff. Please give them more courage, strength and wisdom in caring for those who are ill. We pray for our teachers and university staff who continue to teach regardless of difficult circumstances. We also ask you to be with our scholars and students, especially those who are feeling isolated as they work online. We pray that we as individuals will remain in you and your love, that we will keep our hearts soft like good, rich soil, so that you can teach and guide us to live our lives, so that we reflect you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
do hope that you've enjoyed the service this morning. A warm greeting from our home to yours. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us, now and forevermore. Amen. The birthdays and anniversaries for Emmanuel and Grace are on Sunday the 11th, today Jack Heyman, Monday the 12th, Tamara Fogarty, on Wednesday the 14th, Peter Finlayson and Sheena Smith, on Thursday the 15th, Suzette Wiley, Hercules van der Merwe, Zunele Gebevu turns 20, David Kudradi and Sipa Mandla Korbo. On Friday the 16th, Audrey Switala has her birthday. And on Saturday the 17th, Monica Baird and Dave Hodgson. Our anniversaries in this week coming today, Sunday the 11th, Rona and Keith Scott celebrate 68 years of marriage. On Tuesday the 13th, Lizelle and Gareth English, 21 years. And on Wednesday the 14th, Heather and Martin Marshall, 9 years. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for birthdays and anniversaries. We thank you for all these special people who are celebrating in the week ahead. We ask, Lord, that you would watch over them and protect them and keep them for many, many more in good health and happiness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.